So let's give them a warm welcome. All right, uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. So we are in the Q&A panel section of today's uh, conference. Very excited uh, that all of you are here today. It's a great honor to you know, moderate this panel. So how this is gonna work is that there is a group chat here in Zoom. Uh, yeah, I see a comment already. So we can, uh, so you guys can feel free uh, to just write your questions in the chat. Uh, so I will direct uh, if it's a general question, I will direct it to one of our panelists. And if you have a specific question to one of us, just, you know, write someone's name. So, you know, question for Caitlin about IP, for example, right? So just feel free to write that uh, in the chat. Uh, I love that everyone's also really excited about my RJ. <laughs> All right, so first things first, we're gonna go around and we're just gonna introduce ourselves. And so we're just gonna do this um, alphabetically. So we'll start with Caitlin. Sorry, I'm muting myself here. Uh, so hi everybody, I'm Caitlin Leonard. I am an incoming associate at Castles, Brock & Blackwell, which is a full service Bay Street firm in Toronto. Um, I went to Western Law and have completed articling. So I am called about to the bar. I'm officially a lawyer, which is very exciting. Uh, I have an HBA in criminology and history from University of Toronto, and I applied to law school as a mature student. So I had a whole career working for the Ontario Public Service, doing business and organizational strategy before I even applied to law school. I have also been uh, teaching the LSAT admissions like LSAT prep courses for the Princeton Review for the last uh, six or seven years. Uh, so feel free to ask me all of those questions. Uh, next we have Matthew. How's it going? Yeah, so I'm a 2L at McGill. Uh, I also did my undergrad at McGill. I got a BA in uh, sociology with uh, two minors in poli sci and politics, law and society. So very, um, I guess, concentrated in a particular area of studies. Not that that's necessary to get into law school. Um, and then I took two years off prior to my degree, um, spent one year in Hong Kong um, playing lacrosse actually. And then uh, another year just studying and working as well. I currently run an e-commerce site. Um, so it's been a kind of just getting my feet wet in different areas. And that's kind of, I think, uh, part of the reason or kind of what brought me into law school or got me into law school is kind of having a a little bit of a versatile background. Great, and next we have Rebecca. Hi everyone, so um, I'm a staff lawyer currently at Innocence Canada, and um, I did my uh, law degree at University of Ottawa. Um, I just graduated in 2019, then completed my articling also at Innocence Canada and was called to the bar in June of this year. Um, Prior to that, I did my undergrad and my master's at Western um, in archaeology and bioarchaeology. I then worked for a couple of years as an archaeologist before going to law school. And Sophie. Hi, so I'm a 2L student at the University of Toronto. I'm going to be doing a full-time clinical placement in the Poverty Law Clinic, which is downtown legal services there. I studied psychology and sociology at McGill University before this. And during the summer, I worked for Innocence Canada, including for Rebecca. And I'm currently working part-time in art law and cultural property law for a lawyer. And I'm your moderator for today. Uh, my name is Genevieve Antono. Everyone calls me Jeannie. I'm a third year law student at Harvard Law School. I did my undergrad at Columbia University where I did a BA in political science. Uh, and after graduation, I'll be off to New York uh, to do corporate legal work. Um, so on this panel today, you will hear from uh, two lawyers. Uh, so Caitlin and Rebecca are both done with school, and um, Matthew, Sophie, and I are still in school. So I'll direct your questions um, accordingly. Uh, so your first, the first question that I see uh, in the chat is from Lena. Is there anything you regret doing or not doing on your pathway to become a, to becoming a lawyer? And so I'm going to direct that to the two uh, qualified lawyers on on the panel. So I'll ask uh, Caitlin and Rebecca to take a stab at that. Anything you regret doing or not doing on your pathway? 
Do you want to start, Caitlin, or do you want me to? Uh, well, I was hoping you were going to. I'm trying oh. to think, actually. So if you okay, have, me you too. Know it, if you, okay. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to start to say that I took a very different approach than most people. I did not go directly, as I said earlier, from undergrad to law school, and that um, I think is something that I've wondered if that was the best approach in the past, but I actually think that it was completely fine. I think there are lots of different ways to get to law school. Uh, I took five years off, full time, like completely off, um, and so I was able to apply as a mature student, and so ultimately all of the experiences that I gained in my professional career before of getting to law school were actually very helpful for me. I understand how to operate in a professional environment. I have a lot of, I have a professional network already and some of it is in the legal community. Um, so I actually think that while it has put me sort of a few years behind everybody in terms of, um, in terms of like I, I have sort of five years left, less to work than everybody else, I guess, if that, may, if that makes sense. I sort of feel like I'm sort of starting a bit late. Uh, I actually don't think it's been a bad thing. I think it's actually been in a lot of ways very beneficial. So I, to be honest, I don't think there's anything that I regret. Uh, should have probably focused more in undergrad, got better grades in undergrad, but I mean, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, I, I totally agree with Caitlin. I think taking that time off before going to law school was really beneficial for me as well. Um, I find that sometimes when students go directly from undergrad to law school, um, they might not have made that mental transition into a professional environment yet. Um, and that's, uh, that's totally depends on the person, but it's something that's important to think about when you're going into law school, because it is a professional school um, and you're dealing with very important moments in people's lives so it's important to be mature as well for that reason um, however everyone has a different path I, I definitely don't regret mine um, there's not a lot of, I draw on from my past career and my current career to be honest um, because they were so different but um, I don't regret it. And uh, yeah, I think in terms of getting to where I am now, I think, um, I, I guess, uh, yeah, I don't really have anything oh, else undergrad? to add to that specifically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, undergrad. No, no regrets. No regrets across the board. No, not really. I, I mean, uh, yeah, I could have done better, I'm sure, at certain stages, but like, you know, you can't be a slave to school at the same time. You know, you have to also have life experiences, and that's important as well, I think. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Agreed. Thank you. So our next question is from Sana, which is, did you ever feel that your identity has ever made it harder for you to advance in your field? For example, did it ever feel like being a woman or a person of color made it harder for you to find an audience that took you seriously? Uh, so for this question, uh, Sophie, do you mind taking it? So I'll be happy to speak about that. I've only been in law school for a year and I'm at U of T right now. So my experience is limited to that. At U of T, I've had a great time. I haven't had any circumstances in which that was a concern. I think that perhaps some student groups, uh, maybe for me as an Asian Canadian student, my experience will just be different from a racial minority of a different race. So I think it's important to recognize that we have different experiences, but for me personally, I haven't had that concern at this point. Can I say a couple of things really quickly about that? Of course. So, so I have no personal experiences in this respect in law, which is, which is great. That being said, law is notoriously hard for women. Bay Street in particular, if you go into corporate law, um, it is notoriously difficult. I have friends who are, um, who are looking to have kids reasonably soon, and they are finding that things are more of a challenge. Um, there are also some great articles if you are interested. There are some great articles about, in particular, being Black on Bay Street. And there's one, there's sort of an updated article. One of my classmates actually contributed to it. Um, 
and so so there certainly are resources where you can sort of read more about it and there are certainly people in the legal community if that is something you're experiencing or or do experience people you can reach out to and talk to about um about how to sort of work in this environment yeah and i think in line with what caitlin just mentioned um there are great mentorship opportunities available um through various legal associations. I know the Criminal Law Association has one. Um, there's one for women in the law. Um, and so there's, I, and I'm sure there are many more I just don't know about. So there's definitely opportunities um, if you are struggling or even if you aren't and just want some advice, then there's opportunities to reach out and get mentorship from um, people with similar experiences to yours. So I think that's an important thing as well. All right, so our next question is, what are your thoughts on a dual degree between any undergrad, business in my situation, and JD, specifically the Western Ivy, HBA, and JD dual program? Uh, so this is a question about balancing workload. Uh, is there a volunteer on the panel who would like to take this question? Otherwise, well, I'm good. So I probably know the most about it because some of my classmates were in this program. They were completely fine. They had no problems with the Western, with the Ivy uh, HBA JD program. They are completely fine. Perfect. So what are some of the pros and cons of going to law school in Canada versus America? So if someone could take the Canadian part first, then I'll take the American part after that. Uh, maybe Matthew, since you haven't spoken yet. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, of course, I'm not a lawyer yet, um, but it really depends on what you want to do after your degree right and so that's something you should definitely consider i know um, there are definitely some hoops uh coming back into the states and you'd have to do or coming back from the states so you'd have to do some research before that even going to europe i know some people do that as well or australia right um though we share the common law there there's there's some stuff as well even actually uh being a student from mcgill um you should recognize that in Quebec, actually, there are uh, there, we practice a different law as well, right? So uh, McGill has the uh, French law uh, degree, which is uh, you know the civil law, and then there's the common law as well. Uh, so we have the the dual uh, degree, but other universities in Quebec are just civil law. So you'll find that uh, perhaps if you uh, say I'm from Ontario, if we're to head back to um, to work in Ontario after that degree, you would struggle or maybe find it a little more difficult writing the bar after that. And this is, again, take it with a grain of salt because I haven't written that yet, but that's, that's my understanding so far. Uh, I think it, can I, it just depends on where you practice, where you want to practice. Sorry. Hey, that's okay. And um, I also figured I would mention, so some firms, there's a bit of a stigma if you've gone to another country for a law degree. Um, I think it totally depends on the firm and the lawyer, but um, most of them would prefer, a or some of them would prefer a Canadian law degree. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind as well. Um, but it, it kind of depends on what area you want to practice in. If you want to do international law, for instance, there's, I don't think there's any harm in going to another country for a law degree. So um, that's just what I've heard, but yeah. Yeah, I think 100%. My advice is also the same. First, figure out where you want to work. And then, you know, look at the lawyers who are in the jobs that you want and figure out where that they go to law school. And I think that might be a good way for you to figure out what might be uh, the more strategic path for you. Um, next question. This question is directed, directed to anyone interning with slash working in the field of corporate law. So I'm thinking Caitlin already. Uh, do you believe that corporate law can be continually exciting? I like the fact that it challenges you, but I also want to ensure that it is also a profession that enables you to wake up with a purpose. Uh, so Caitlin, uh, do you think that corporate law can be continually exciting? I think if you define corporate law broadly, sure. Um, I think, oh dear. So I did not, I personally, I think it's personal preference. Entirely, I think it's personal preference. I know I have some colleagues who, uh, who love working with companies and helping them structure deals and things like that, and that's great. It's not my thing. 
Um, I'm in a corporate law firm, as in it's a big sort of full service base rate firm, but I will not be practicing traditional corporate law. I will not be doing mergers and acquisitions or securities work or anything like that. Um, if you want to, um, you know, if you find writing prospectuses to be fun, have at it. <laughs> um, personally, not my thing. Um, I will be doing a hybrid, I will have a hybrid practice. So I've been appointed to both the business and litigation groups at Castles. I will be at least for the foreseeable future doing some intellectual property litigation and doing some competition law on both the barrister and solicitor sides. So I will be working on, for example, some of those mergers and acquisitions, but from the perspective of competition law, so helping to make sure that deals are structured so that they stay onside the competition law in Canada. Um, it, there, there will be some regulatory stuff and other stuff sort of thrown in there. I will, in all likelihood, be doing some other, other sort of general corporate and commercial litigation. So I think that stuff is very interesting. I specifically and purposefully picked um, or, or intentionally sort of went into and built relationships in the areas of law that I thought were going to be challenging sort of within the broader umbrella of corporate law, sort of if you define it broadly. Um, but the sort of traditional law of like contracts and, and securities and, or contracts and, and m and and stuff, I understand that that can get quite repetitive <laughs> in the earlier years. Uh, once you get more senior, I think it becomes more interesting is my understanding. Sorry, I can't be more helpful. So I will also be going to a corporate law firm um, after graduation uh, in New York, where I'll be doing kind of the typical kind of, you know, a little bit of M&A, a little bit of funds, maybe a little bit of capital markets, not sure yet. And I think that um, it really is a personality thing. Uh, so for me, uh, I'm a bit strange in that sometimes when I read like the Financial Times or the Wall Street Journal or whatever, and I hear about, you know, company A buying company B, I actually gravitate towards that. Like, I actually think it's genuinely interesting, but I know that there are a lot of people who just kind of want to tear their eyeballs out when they're, you know, faced with these sorts of matters. So I think you've got to be honest for yourself, uh, with yourself, right? Don't be like, I want to do corporate law because of the money or like the prestige or whatever, right? You've got to figure out this, you're, you're joining a profession and you're picking an area of work where you'll be working 12 plus hours a day, you know, conceivably. So you want to, you want to go with your interests. So, um, I think that's how you should decide and not, not based on like, uh, I think all parts of law can be challenging and interesting. You, you don't, don't pick based on, on, um, I don't know, money or prestige. Can I actually add something to that? So I think something you've, something you've said, actually, I'd just like to jump off of, you should look at the long range view of what people do over the course of their careers in this particular area. So I think practicing corporate law at a junior level looks very, very different than practicing corporate law at a senior level where you are interacting with clients and you're involved in the business strategy side of things a lot more. At the more junior levels, there will be a lot of things like due diligence where you're reviewing a lot of contracts. Um, personally, as I said, not my thing. However, if you find contracts to be really interesting, have at it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the next question from Gabrielle, uh, I think it's a bit similar to one that we've covered before. So I'm going to skip it. Uh, Gabrielle, if you have a different question, please feel free to submit a different one in the chat. Uh, so from Lena, I'm currently interested in being a criminal lawyer. So I'm looking at Rebecca and Sophie, and I want to know more about your experiences. What did the job entail and what the emotional slash mental pressure is like? Yeah, so um, I'm in a bit of a unique um, subset of criminal law, uh, working only on innocence cases at the moment. Um, that being said, I have friends in other areas of criminal law. Um, so um, what was the first part of the question? Experience, kind of? Yeah, um, more about your experiences, what the job entailed, and what yeah. the emotional pressure is like. So um, my experiences will be a bit different. I'm dealing with people who have been wrongly convicted of crimes. And um, obviously that's very, very emotional thing to deal with. Um, they're often pretty devastated. And even if they are out of prison at the time, um, they're dealing with a lot of after effects of that wrongful imprisonment. Um, so yeah, it takes a huge emotional toll um, in other areas of criminal law as well. You're dealing with um, crime, so it's heavy. 
Um, there's a lot of burnout in criminal law. Um, a lot of people burn out of the field in 10 years or so because of the emotional toll. And you know, you're also, as defense lawyer, often getting calls in the middle of the night for a new file you're working on. So that's not easy either. Um, that being said, it's also really rewarding work um, and very interesting. Um, so yeah, I think um, if you're, if you want to get into it, I think you, you really have to know yourself and know whether you're able to kind of compartmentalize that kind of work because it can be very traumatic. Um, and it's important to also be a kind of compassionate person, I think, as well, if you're going to enter this kind of area of law, um, uh, just because you are dealing with people who have been through a lot of trauma in their lives. So, um, yeah, it's, I think, yeah, unless there's any follow-up questions, that would be what I'd say about criminal law. I'd be happy to jump in and echo what Rebecca said about criminal law. I also work at Innocence Canada, so some of those experiences will be similar. So I'll focus on two other aspects. Uh, the first will be the Downtown Legal Services Clinic. I think Osgood also has a similar one where you can take on your own clients. And no matter which law school you go to, I imagine that you might have some similar opportunities of working with clients directly in a criminal law context. So I think for something like that, a lot of my mentors have mentioned the role of vicarious trauma. You're dealing with cases and there will be vicarious trauma. Although a lot of firms or the government may have mental health supports, what I heard again and again from these older lawyers is that your colleagues are one of the best sources of support because they're going through the process with you. They truly understand and you guys are working as a team. I'm also working with a lawyer right now on research about art crime and crimes against uh, cultural heritage. So for example, looting of archeological sites and other such crimes. And I'm also finding that quite heavy. So this doesn't directly deal with, uh, this doesn't directly deal with life, life and limb being threatened, but it's the looting of human remains. It's uh, tribes and peoples who can't access their own ancestors or who see their own ancestors in a museum. It's art that's taken away from individuals and thus that has huge cultural value or huge sentimental value and that's never recovered. I think one stat is that of 20 pieces of art stolen, 19 will never be recovered. So I think that's an intersection of art and cultural property law and criminal law and something that also has a lot of uh, tragedy just within the cases. So criminal law is an aspect that has a lot, many heavy aspects. And I think if you're able to lean on your colleagues, that's something that older lawyers have told me was very helpful. So I see two questions in the chat that uh, generally have to do with undergrad majors. Uh, so when applying to law school, does undergrad major matter or just looking for the, de the degree? And another question, uh, would you recommend pursuing an arts or business undergrad compared to one in STEM for going into legal? Uh, so with regard to undergrad majors, maybe Matthew, you can take a stab. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I, I don't think that your degree, like whatever you choose to study necessarily matters. You have people coming from all sorts of backgrounds going into law school. So like, I think really what you should be focused on, and I know there was an admissions uh, session earlier on, I think he mentioned something similar, but um, enriching your experience um, and try to really aim for personal growth because that growth will help you um, in the process of applying, right, for your personal statements, um, even those soft skills uh, for interviews um, and, even like logic stuff like the LSAT, uh, it all ends up kind of trickling in. And so really set yourself up for those kind of experiences that um, make you a better you know, candidate for law school or whatever you wanna do really. I don't think you should narrow it down with the classic like cookie cutter uh, pre-law type of um, degree. If it's, if it's helpful to just add to that a little bit, I know people who went to law school who were professional musicians and professional, well, and one of my classmates was a professional ballerina. Um, I know that, uh, I know people who came in from engineering backgrounds and actually the engineering uh, folks tended to do quite well because they were taught very sort of rigorous logic and things like that, that I think are, it, it lends itself well to, to legal thinking. Um, 
So just to, to echo what was already said, I think as long as you're going to do well, I don't think it matters what you do. Uh, my understanding is that law schools don't really care. I could be wrong. Um, but I think as long as you pick something that you enjoy, because you'll do better at the things that you enjoy. A hundred percent. So the next question has... Uh, so the next question has to do with a uh, requirement for French uh, for practicing law in Canada. So I'll take, I'll take a, a volunteer for this. How beneficial is fluency in French for those pursuing law in Canada? Uh, so coming from Ottawa, I can take a stab at that. Um, so um, I actually am not 100% fluent in French. I did French immersion in elementary and high school, but I've definitely lost touch over the years. <laughs> Um, so it's not necessary if you are in any province but Quebec. Um, and if you're in Ottawa, it's definitely beneficial. I will say that a lot of the firms uh, deal with clients in the Gatineau area as well. And there's also a lot of government work, obviously, in Ottawa. And for a lot of those government positions, um, being bilingual is a requirement. So. Um, it kind of just depends on where you want to practice, but um, it's certainly not a requirement for most parts of the English speaking country. And I would say to probably the Maritimes being bilingual would help because there's some parts of the Maritimes that are um, more, uh, have a lot of French speaking communities. Even uh, in Montreal, my understanding is unless uh, you're practicing uh, on the outsides of the city, uh, for the most part, larger firms uh, who tend to work with English speaking uh, clients will be all in English anyway. So, um, I mean, with that said, too, I think that having any sort of second language uh, is an asset as well, right? So, um, if you have that in, in your uh, resume and you actually are bilingual, then definitely keep that up. So the next question is, I want to work in America for corporate law. So would it be better if I went to law school in America or Canada? So I spent uh, my last three summers at New York law firms. And I would say that most of the people that I uh, encountered, uh, ha you know, had American uh, law degrees. Uh, so that would be what I would advise you to do. Um, I'm curious to hear from the Canadian law students if you've seen uh, recruiting uh, happen at your schools for uh, American jobs, or is it more difficult? I can briefly talk about that. Mm -hmm. So at U of T, I know that American firms do go up. New York firms come up to recruit students from U of T every year. I think that happens to McGill students as well. Matthew, maybe you can talk about that. And I've seen many of my classmates, both upper years and people in the same year, aim for jobs in the U.S. and get them. So I think that if that's an option that you're interested in, from what I've seen, there's a strong alumni network and there are people who are coming up specifically to interview you, at least at U of T. I can't speak for other schools. Thank you. Uh, so next question, uh, wh when do you officially decide which area of law to specialize in? Uh, can I, All right, go ahead. I will, I will happily talk about that. So uh, I think that my best advice would be to keep an open mind when you go into law school because you may change your mind. I thought I was going to want to be a criminal lawyer. I worked in the criminal justice system before law school. I worked with crown attorneys very closely. Um, I have friends who are crown attorneys and they're great. And I really thought that I wanted to be a criminal lawyer or was going to want to be. And I have emerged the other side of law school and I went to Bay Street. Um, and when I started working as a summer student in uh, on Bay Street, I still didn't know what kind of law I wanted to practice. I thought maybe litigation, but I wasn't sure. And so I sort of tried lots of things. And then um, I articled and I had a sense that I wanted litigation. Um, and then while I was articling, I spent a lot more time doing competition law and IP law and loved both of those things. And so really, it wasn't until closer to the end of articling that I even really knew what I wanted to do. And even then, uh, the way higher back works, you aren't always given the most choice. And so I was hired back into both of these groups, which was actually going to get like business and litigation, which will actually give me 
a great opportunity to even refine my career further over the next several years. So at some point, I'm pretty confident that I'm going to have to pick between the things that I'm doing and sort of become more specialized. But for now, my firm is even giving me the opportunity to do multiple different things. Uh, so I'm not even 100% sure what I'm going to be doing 10 years from now. Uh, and I'm about to start practice as a lawyer. So, so all of that to say, you don't actually need to decide until um, like there are some key points along the way. So if you want to do family law, you're going to have to apply probably to family law firms because in, to my understanding, a lot of them tend to be specialized. If you want to do criminal law, that's a decision you're going to have to make earlier because you will have to do things like uh, take criminal law classes and demonstrate an interest in criminal law throughout law school. Um, however, if you don't know, that's still completely fine. So for the next uh, question, I, I'd like a volunteer. Have you all tried any pro bono work? Uh, how was it uh, and do you recommend it? I can take that one. So um, I have done pro bono work um, as a student. Uh, so I worked um, for the Sexual Assault Network and doing research for them. Um, I was also on um, a committee for Pro Bono Students Canada at my university. Um, I really enjoyed the work. I think it's a great way to give back. Um, and uh, as a lawyer, you definitely can get involved in a lot of pro bono work. Um, with that being said, you have to talk to your firm about it first if you're at a firm. Um, and they might have certain pro bono requirements as well. Um, and working at Innocence Canada, I'm on a salaried position with the organization, but uh, we work with pro bono lawyers frequently. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a great program, and it, it's honestly it's yeah it's like I said, great to give back and um, and do that work. So yeah, I would recommend it. <laughs> it I also looks great on your resume. So <laughs> I can also talk about pro bono work as a student. I, like Rebecca, I was also part of Pro Bono Students Canada, and I was working in the field of racial justice with the Urban Alliance on Race Relations. So that was about five hours of work as a student. We were working with other law students at the same time, just working on the ground with a community organization and stakeholders in these matters. So I had a great experience there. There's a, it's a great community, Pro Bono Students Canada. And I think that's available at every Canadian law school. So that's, uh, I've only had one year's experience of law school, but from what I've seen, it was a lovely experience. So, so just to, to add a little bit, pro bono work looks like a lot of different things. It's not all uh, in the sort of criminal and human rights areas. Uh, I worked in the business, uh, the business law clinic when I was in undergrad, or sorry, not, on, oh my goodness, law school. Um, I was in law school, I worked in the business law clinic. So my, I had clients that were small businesses working in the London area that needed legal services, but couldn't, couldn't afford legal services for whatever they needed. It was a wide variety of things. And so that's very meaningful work as well. People are very thankful to have your help. I've done some pro bono, pro bono work at my firm. I did some during articling. Uh, and again, that looks like a lot of different things. We actually had a constitutional sort of human rights um, case that I did some, some work for, and it was fantastic. So even at a big corporate law firm, there are opportunities to get involved, to Rebecca's earlier point, to get involved in, in lots of different kinds of things. Uh, I know that a lot of the lawyers that I, I work with also do like a, there's like a phone line where people can, people staff a phone line and lawyers staff a phone line and people looking for legal support in different areas can call, call that, that number. And, and like there are, there's lots of different ways to get involved in lots of different ways. So before we move on from this topic, there's a follow on question. What is pro bono? Uh, maybe Sophie or Matthew. In my understanding, it's that you're doing legal work for free for a community that needs it. Yeah, that's my understanding too. <laughs> All right, so we have a question specifically for Caitlin with regard to networking uh, and building relationships. So uh, Caitlin, you mentioned building and finding relationships in your desired sector slash field of law. I know many, quote, more specific or specialized fields of law require these types of relationships, which can be hard to find. How do you develop such relationships? 
Uh, so, so I was referring, I, if I recall correctly, if I, if I understand where that question is coming from, I'm sorry if I, if I misinterpret, um, I meant within my firm. So as a summer student and an articling student, one of the most important things for me was to build relationships with the lawyers there. So as I'm exploring different areas of law and taking on different types of assignments, my, uh, one of the things that I was looking to do was not just interact with lawyers in a very transactional way in which they give me work and I do it and I give it back and that's it. I was looking to sort of get to know people a little more and build some more meaningful connections that will then help me um, get hired back, for example, as people who will speak on my behalf. And, and so, um, and also, I mean, it's just good to network and build relationships where you work. Um, people are humans and it's good to, you know, get to know people on a, on a, more meaningful level generally. So um, in terms of how to develop relationships, I'm sure other folks on the panel can jump in here as well. Um, throughout my career, I think that talking to people on a human level is, is the first step. Um, you know, I have had mentors through my career at different points in law and out of law that I can go to, mentors I can go to for, for advice and for um, you know, I, d I really don't know how to, to, I'm, I'm trying to think from the perspective of people who are not yet in law school and how to start. And I'm not really sure what to say, except that if you can volunteer or find a job in an area when I was in high school, and I think this is going to touch on, on a question that I saw that's going to come up. Um, I worked as a co-op student when I was in high school for a small law firm in the, I were, grew up in a very small city or outside of a small city, but um, I worked as a co-op student in a law firm there. And so I was able to sort of start building relationships in the legal community that way. Um, I'm sure other folks can jump in from the perspective of not yet in law school. What do you do? I can yeah. Jump in oh, go um, ahead, Matt. Yeah. I, I was very involved in like, various different clubs, um, like student clubs, uh, going through my undergrad and, uh, being involved like that, obviously you, you build your own peer network and some people, uh, say you're a freshman and you have some seniors in the clubs who, uh, are ahead of you, um, in terms of graduating will end up going into law school. So kind of like those indirect connections will may become, and often do become, or not often can become, uh, so those mentor kind of dynamic uh, relationships that you're looking for. So I, I think like build those relationships and don't, you don't necessarily have to focus out right away on just finding somebody who's in the legal field, but um, just, you know, strong relationships generally. And often you'll find that people end up being in the legal field anyways. Yeah. That, that helped me. Very similarly to Matthew, and I was also at McGill, I found that being on the McGill traveling model UN delegation team or being on the undergraduate moot team, these sorts of extracurriculars tend to attract students who might be interested in law school. So a few years later now, looking back, many people on both of those teams ended up going into law school and they've been great sources of uh, friendship, amusement, support, uh, professional advice. So I found that very helpful. And these are just people that you went traveling with, people you did model you in with. Yeah, and I think as um, Matthew and Sophie both mentioned, like um, think of your network also as your peers, right? Because um, it's important, they, they've all created or are trying to create their own networks as well. And they may have met someone in an area of law that you might be interested in and can create a conversation um, or set up a conversation for you with that person. So yeah, don't disregard um, your peers as well, um, especially when you're in law school. So um, yeah. So the next question I think was directed at me. Um, the question is from Eliza and asks um, how, can you speak to how you factored in the information to uh, you know, pick between a US and a Canadian law school and how did I ultimately choose an American law school? So the thing is I didn't apply to Canadian law schools. I'm not from Canada. I went to undergrad uh, in New York. I wanted to work in New York and I applied to American law firms, so uh, law schools and law firms. So uh, I think my answer here wouldn't be uh, the most relevant because I wasn't balancing Canadian versus US schools. Curious to hear if anyone else on the panel was thinking of American schools. Um, 
Okay. All right. So sorry, Eliza, no, no direct answers uh, to your question here about how to balance uh, the decision. Question uh, from Manmi uh, regarding the University of Ottawa. So I think this will, this will be for uh, Rebecca. Uh, I currently go to the University of Ottawa. Are there any opportunities that are available to students there? Unclear what sorts of opportunities, but any sorts of advice regarding that specific, specific school would be great. Um, so I don't have any experience there for undergrad as I went to Western. Um, in terms of once you, if you get into U Ottawa, there's obviously a lot of great um, things you can get involved with there. Um, like I mentioned, pro bono, as well as there's the University of Ottawa Legal Aid Clinic, um, which you can work for, um, and uh, partnerships with a bunch of legal clinics uh, across the city. Um, and then there's opportunities that are available in most law schools, such as, um, you know, uh, working for Amnesty International or, uh, you know, um, doing a big research project with a professor. So I know this is very general information, but I'm not, um, I can't really speak to undergrad experience at that university. I'm sure there's clubs that you can get involved with, but I'm not, I'm not sure anything specific. So the next question from Alina, I'm going to direct at Sophie. Uh, it is, how do you ac access uh, all these presumably competitive opportunities and extracurriculars as undergrads, for instance, networking, interviews, requirements, et cetera? What were some of your uh, favorite experiences? So how did you access competitive opportunities as an undergrad? Uh, I applied. So <laughs> most of these competitive opportunities, they may have tryouts. So the moot team for undergrad, they had tryouts. Oh, I just saw the pre-law society comment. That was the case at McGill. I imagine that other schools would also have pre-law societies for model United Nations. There would be tryouts and then they would select people for the team. But not every relevant opportunity requires a tryout. I think a lot of the skills that you might build in undergraduate extracurriculars will end up being helpful in law school. For example, knowing how to orally advocate for something, knowing how to analyze complex material. These are all things that you can get from your class readings, and your seminars and such. So these are all relevant things. So for the next question, I would love to have a, a volunteer or two. Um, what kinds of activities would you recommend that we get involved in as high school students to get a stronger understanding of the legal field? Um, I would, that, that's tricky because um, I, think, I think you can definitely try and volunteer. Um, for different uh, um, firms potentially, but um, there's no work really available for high school students, I don't think, um, in the legal fields. Um, there's definitely a, a lot of organizations, nonprofit organizations out there that would welcome student volunteers. Um, so those are kind of law adjacent opportunities um, and some directly work in the legal field as well. Um, yeah, I think, I think that that's kind of tricky to get into at that stage, um, but I don't know if the other panelists have any other ideas. I can see, I can talk briefly about this. So what we were told as we entered first year is that we don't need law related experience it can help, but is absolutely not necessary. And it's perfectly fine to start building up these experience once you're in law school. We've been told multiple times that uh, everyone understands that there aren't that many law related experiences for high school students. So you're not really expected to have them, if I understand this correctly. Yeah. You know, you could- Matthew, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Okay, I, I, was just, I was just gonna say that a lot of lawyers like to talk about what they do. Uh, quite frankly, lawyers like to talk. Um, it's, it's a pretty common thing in this profession. Um, and they like to talk about what they do and they're really happy to mentor students and to talk to people. And so if you are super, super keen and you and you want to learn of what you know life as a lawyer is all about, then I'm sure that you can reach out to lawyers in your community. You can reach out to me if you want um, to chat about, about things. I'm sure that 
people would be fairly receptive to sitting down for coffee or virtually or, you know, in person in a few years. <laughs> um, people are, people in this profession tend to value and, and do a lot of mentoring and things. So I'm pretty sure you'd find, you'd find lawyers are pretty receptive to that kind of thing. Um, for me, I found actually a lot of my learning about the law happened in class. Um, and I was lucky enough to have that. That was like kind of the area I focused on. Um, so stuff like criminology or constitution stuff um, in poli sci. Um, so maybe if you have available electives, that's also something you could do to just, you know, um, it's, it's not going to be the same. You won't learn case law um, and you won't, like there's a lot of practical stuff that you, you will miss out on, but it's a good start to understanding um, kind of the big picture workings. And I think that another thing you should remember is that um, the law kind of, it, it's not a vacuum, right? It, it works in society. So understanding how, you know, the world works, how, like getting experience in some sort of business stuff will help you uh, in corporate law, right? Understanding how the justice system works will help you if you go into criminal law. So it, you don't really have to get too uh, um, specific right away. And you probably shouldn't in my mind. Yeah, hundred percent agree. So, I mean, if you want to become like a corporate lawyer, I think the fact that let's say that Matthew like runs an e-commerce business, that is extremely interesting, you know, uh, for like future corporate law experience uh, versus like if, you know, a, a law related experience that might be a, a bit further away from the business side. So uh, definitely, uh, you know, learn as much as you can about the world. Uh, no rush to jump into like law related um, experiences, I think too early. Uh, the more you know, the better. Uh, thoughts on doing an LLB in the UK and then doing the conversion exam versus uh, doing law school in Canada versus uh, the and the US. So any thoughts on the LLB in the UK and conversion? Any volunteers for that? Um, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, sorry to say. Um, I, I think there is a bit of trouble transitioning once you get back to Canada. You haven't studied in that um, area, so um, Canadian law is different than law in England. So yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend it if at all possible. However, like I said before, like if you are interested in a in, uh, career in international law, it might not be as much of an issue. Um, so yeah, that would be my advice. But my pa my fellow panelists might have an, another opinion on that. Completely sort of different approach to answering this question. Undergrad is a time of like self exploration and having fun. And I don't know that um, everybody comes out of undergrad the like you're just so young, right? You haven't, I'm not sure everybody comes out the other end the same as when they came in. And so you may not decide that you may decide in undergrad that law is not for you. Like you may, you may decide you want to be an engineer or do something completely different. Um, so I'm not, I mean, I had fun taking lots of different types of courses and, and I wouldn't have wanted to focus so much on one thing, I guess, in, in undergrad. So if you're applying to, to undergrad, if you're in high school right now, um, take a look at all the things you want to do. Uh, undergrad is lots of fun. You learn lots of things. You have lots of fun experiences. Um, and if you are looking to become a lawyer and you are like the, and you know, for sure, that's what you want to do. That's great. Uh, I think that's awesome. Um, but I think you would be doing yourself a disservice if you forego that opportunity to, to have fun and do lots of self exploration and stuff like that, because you already know that what you want to do is practice law at the end of the day. And so you're so focused on, on, on that. So sorry, that, that sounds like a, I sound like an, like an old woman talking to you from, you know, the, the lens of retrospection or whatever the heck it is, um, which is all probably very true, but <laughs> I, uh, yeah, have fun in undergrad, do well, <laughs> like do, do well, but, but I don't know. Sorry, I thought the question was LLB, yeah. but I might have misunderstood that yeah. question if oh. it was <laughs> so, so, so the idea is that it's a three-year process because you go to law school immediately out of high school. In, oh, I see. Okay. okay. You don't actually yeah. do an undergraduate degree and then go to law school. It's like one process. So you end up right. a lot younger graduating and stuff. And I also don't know that when I was, you know, 21, I was going to be ready to practice as a lawyer. So that's another thing. Oh, no. Me neither. Yeah. So. 
I definitely misunderstood the question. Yeah, if you're an undergrad, go for it. Like, it, it really doesn't matter where you come from once you, you know, transition from that point. You're, you know, you're young still, you're experiencing life. So that's all positive. <laughs> So I just wanted to give everyone a heads up that we have about nine minutes left on this panel. So we might not be able to get um, through all the questions. So just kind of a heads up to people submitting uh, questions. But the next question I would like to direct at both um, Matthew and Caitlin, uh, how difficult is it to get an articling placement? And is this the only route? route? <laughs> I'm not a lawyer, so I can't answer that. So it depends on the type of articling placement you want. Uh, it is not the only route in Ontario. Certainly, I cannot speak to other provinces. In Ontario, there is something called the, I think it's the LPP, it's the Law Practice Program. It's sort of like, I, I did not look into this. I'm actually not super familiar with it, but I understand it to be sort of like, a, like an additional year of law school, but it's more practical with, you get more sort of hands-on experience. Um, my understanding is that, you know, ideally you do an articling you, you would article somewhere, you do an articling position, but it's certainly not the only way to become licensed. Uh, different articling positions are more and less competitive depending on what you want. Um, certainly the Bay Street, the sort of traditional route law schools sort of push you in is to do what I did. You go to, um, you go through the on-campus interview process, which is like not something you need to know about right now, but it's basically, um, a really intense interview process. It's like a pre-screening thing. And then you go do in-firm interviews where you do like three full days of, of really intense interviews. And that is a very, very, very competitive process. Uh, it's different finding jobs through different streams. Um, and I know that some of my friends who did not find, find articling jobs through that sort of more traditional Bay Street process, are completely fine. They found great jobs at firms they love, working with people they love, and um, they sort of just did it slightly differently. They reached out to their networks, they um, applied for for jobs differently, and Rebecca, I'm sure, can talk a lot more to the sort of non Bay Street method of recruitment, because I'm not as familiar with that, but certainly there are lots and lots of different ways to find a job. If that's not something that any of you need to fuss about or stress about at all right now. Yeah, definitely. Um, there's a lot of ways. You, I think being very active about um, searching online about different career opportunities in areas that interest you is very important. Um, but that's something down the line. Like you really, I think getting to law school and in your first year or so of law school, you, you're really just trying to experience as much as possible about different areas of practice that are available and um, just try and figure out what your interests are. So I don't think that's something to worry about at this early stage for sure. So I think the rest of the questions can actually be kind of combined into the sort of like, what advice generally do you have? How can we succeed? What can we do now? So maybe we can all like take a stab at this question. What's one piece of advice that you would give uh, to the audience members? Uh, this conference. So maybe we'll just go down the line, uh, start with Caitlin. Oh dear. Um, I, this is just off the top of my head. I'm sure I will come up with more helpful things <laughs> once the folks start talking. Um, but I think that it is to really, if you are, if you are in high school, if you are in undergrad, I wouldn't fuss so much right now about what happens after you get in. Certainly in Canada, I think that getting an my experience was that getting into law school was the hardest part. Once you're in there, there's a lot of support available. Um, it's a lot of work. And if you're willing to put the work in, it's not that bad. Um, I think that that fussing sort of about jobs and about all of the other things is a problem for tomorrow's, like for you, you know, down the line. This is a tomorrow or three year from now problem or whatever it is. I wouldn't, I wouldn't fuss. So, um, Again, putting on my old woman hat, uh, really, like just focus on doing what you're interested in and do well at what you're interested in. And the rest, once you get into law school, you'll figure it out. You'll learn all the things you need to know. There are lots of people available to help you at that point. Maybe Rebecca? 
Oh, okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure who was next. <laughs> um, yeah, I think echoing Caitlin's um, ideas there, like just have fun, like just, you know, follow your, what you're passionate about. I was an archaeologist for a long time before I came to law. Like, I don't think, I think it makes better lawyers in, in the end of the day, at the end of the day, if um, people come from a variety of experiences and have a bunch of different ideas and skill sets that they bring to the legal profession. And I think it's in the end, even if you're always thinking of law and that's your end goal all along, I think it's beneficial to um, come to it from a place where you've explored other passions and um, other areas. So yeah, I, I think that's important. And Sophie? One piece of advice I'd have is to ignore the noise, ignore where everybody else seems to be swimming. As we're going through this process of undergrad and law school, there's a lot of conversations about what you're supposed to do, where you're supposed to end up. And I think uh, something I've personally experienced with criminal law or my interest in art law, these are both a bit niche within the broader framework. I think it's just, I found it meaningful to try to ignore the noise to the extent that it's possible and just to do very directed research on what you actually want to do to figure out where you need to go, even if that path might differ a little bit from the traditional Bay Street route. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to echo pretty much what everybody else has said. And it, I really think that, uh, especially in undergrad, it, you should try to find that balance in your life, you know, make those friends, have those experiences. I think everything, all of that comes together to make you a better lawyer. Um, you don't have to stress, like, I don't think you should be calculating every activity you do to uh, make it something on your CV. And I actually think that um, deeper experiences are more valuable. And I think people find that than, you know, just a vast amount of uh, things that you've done, right? So really try to get deep in there, challenge yourself, and then go from there. All right, so that is the end of the Q&A segment of uh, today's conference. Uh, I'm gonna turn it back to the presidents. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today.